Whether below water or on land, life is precious. That's why we've invited three experts who seek to protect our ecosystems and the creatures that make up life on our Earth. They are Felix Mudwiri, a program coordinator for Friends of Nairobi National Park, Madhukar Swayambu, the co-founder and research head of Vitek Srijan LLP, and Nick Mataksa Schwarten, an executive director for Proud PH. After their presentations, they kindly took questions from the audience. Before we start with the Q&A session, I'd like to thank our speakers again for sharing their valuable knowledge and experience with us. And I always say, with step-by-step step and drop-by-drop, drop, we'll certainly make a big change for a thrivable future. With that being said, uh, we'll move on to our first question, which is open to our speakers and anybody, anyone can answer first. So my question is, with your years of experience dealing with different stakeholders, what do you believe is the most challenging aspect of human beings to convince them to change their behavior or practices for a thrivable future? Thank you. What uh, I think everybody, each one of us, uh, all the speakers were talking about is first bring the awareness. If the people have the knowledge, they will certainly change in line with what is more sustainable. Right. Like if somebody is standing next to a heap of uh, filth, waste, right, as long as he's not aware that it is waste, he will continue to stand there. But the moment he get that awareness that, OK, I'm getting that foul smell or I'm, I'm seeing a lot of uh, house flies around me, he will naturally step away. Right. So human behavior is all linked to awareness, to the knowledge. So the more knowledge you have, the more aware you'll be and uh, accordingly you'll change your behavioral pattern. And uh, probably uh, the Thrivability Project is all about bringing in that awareness to the people, right? Uh, getting in uh, speakers from all parts of the world. All we are trying to do is get the best practices to the knowledge of the people and the more aware people are, it will naturally shape up. So. That's what my take is about uh, changing the behavioral pattern. So I asked that, uh, how can we change the mindset of people uh, or bring about change in their behavior? It starts with um, realizing that what we are doing today is going to have an impact on future generations. What we are enjoying today is as a result of good action on sustainability by the previous generations. So once we realize that, this is a rate of passage, and indeed we are going to safeguard everything and kill the, 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 the feeling of selfishness in everything that we are doing. Secondly, it's realizing that every resource that we have is a resource to lead us to prosperity, including water. And it's more of sharing this uh, prosperity with others. Thank you. Nick? Yes, thank you so much. Uh, um, I really think that Felix uh, said the most important thing here, healing of selfishness. Uh, awareness is something which I've been observing over the last uh, 10 years of my research very intensely. And uh, there's a lot of misconceptions. Education had been in the schools here in the Philippines for 20 years. It's not a lack of awareness. People know exactly what's going on. Uh, it is not painful for them. This is why after 10 years, I'm starting now to really focus on empathy as a solution and that was what my presentation was about, to really trying to start now. Um, Matukar, I, I'm starting now to uh, work myself through 20 years of uh, uh, behavior science. Uh, there are tons of documents out there, tons of researches out there, some of them are with very uh, 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 confusing outcomes. Um, at the end of the day, my personal experience is that awareness itself is not enough. We need to start them making feeling a pain. And that pain, that is something which I think can only be reached through empathy. And I believe, sadly enough, that this is not possible in our generation anymore. So what we are doing is trying to look into future generations. How can we build empathy in our children so that they someday can create a new generation in which uh, this healing of selfishness can happen or will be happening? Thank you so much. And let, let me just explain my perspective, Nick. Uh, see, in Sanskrit, we have a word called Ved. Now, Ved means knowledge. But we have another word, which is Vedana, which is actually pain. 
right? So till the time you don't get the knowledge, you won't feel the pain at all, right? So everything is so beautifully linked together with the knowledge. The more knowledge you have, the more empathy you will build up, right? The problem is, as I explained in my presentation, there are a lot of myths and there are a lot of half-truths. Right. So the education system is there within the place, but then it is not explaining the natural phenomena like water is just H2O for 90 percent of the population of the planet, which is I'm talking about the educated population. They feel water is just H2O, nothing beyond that. Right. Whereas water bodies are the only structures which can be a carbon sink as well as GHG emitters, depending upon the way you have kept them. Right. So it is very, very important to get the holistic perspective, the holistic knowledge. The more knowledge you have, the more empathy you will build up. So that is how uh, my point of view is completely in sync with your point of view as well. Absolutely. Um, we all recognize that the education piece is very important. If people don't know, then they're not going to be able to make a, a, a wiser decision. Um, but what a lot of us are appreciating as time go by is we're moving more towards the issue of the behavioral element, right? Uh, you can lead the horse to water, but you cannot force it to drink, right? So we have a typical situation where many people around the world who know better, uh, can do better, but do not do better. It's simple to be lazy and not do better. So the behavioral element is a really big part. And it's something I know at Thrive we're, we're concentrating on. We're doing more and more uh research in that area it is one of these non-deterministic parts of science so it's not as easy as just saying you press this button this thing happens it really requires a lot more um involvement or understanding and so forth and um i think uh, we all appreciate the fact of the complexity of particularly a human being getting them to actually take the actions that indeed they need to take. So, um, yeah, the education piece is one part of it. And then the behavioral bit of how to actually ensure people take those positive actions that we need to see. So for many of us here in the room, we already know and, and try and do the right thing or hopefully are doing the right thing, but there are many, many more out there who are simply ignoring, um, you know, these actions that need to be taken. So that's all. Thanks. I'll ask my uh, next question to Felix. We understand that community participation can bring about a big change. But when it comes to long-standing cultural beliefs, values, traditions, how do you engage with the community to help them change their attitude towards biodiversity conservation? Uh, it, it would be good if you can share any example. Thank you. In terms of community engagement, um, there are two ways in how you do this. A community in need and co a community that has something to offer. That's now in the case of Nairobi National Park. Community in need, I consider that as a person whose livestock, which is the only form of livelihood, has been predicted on by a lion that is stray, moved out of the park, uh, because on the southern side, the park is not fenced. And then overnight, their livestock, you find that they are all dead. No, this is someone in need. It is very difficult to send a message on conservation is important to a family whose breadwinner has been killed by a lion, a child who is struggling because they can't, that they can, they can no longer support their school, because their dad is no longer uh, there to support them. Then the other side, there is the community that has something to offer. They are like, uh, um, what's happening in Nairobi National Park? How much litter are you experiencing? What can we do to support? So all these people, we didn't them. So um, one way we are engaging the community that is in need is every time we are having meetings with them, because what these people do is they retaliate when their animals have been killed. They also poison the lion. We want to protect the community and we want to protect the wildlife side. It's more of... Um, we try the best that we can through innovative approaches to address the problem of the human lion conflict. We are deploying and donating lion lights to them. If for anyone who hasn't heard about lion lights, they flash at night. It's just the system of uh, the way a car has that work. And by flashing at night, that creates a sense of human presence in a community bomb where livestock is. And that keeps lions and other predators away. We are also working with Kenya Wildlife Service to 
make it easy for them to quickly process compensation cases. If livestock has been killed, property has been destroyed by what? Like, how can compensation be made easier? And then um, by having meetings with them, we are also, you know, trying to show them that we are present, we are here to support you. And then through that, as long as they are seeing a support system around, they're not going to retaliate by killing the lions. At least that's one of the things that we are doing to make sure that there's peaceful coexistence between people and what like. Thank you uh, for sharing that. Um, my next question is for Madhukar. Please guide us through the economics technology and uh, why it's a requirement for a body per water body to be 10,000 square feet. And what are the solutions for smaller water bodies? I was looking at your website, so I thought this will be interesting to know. We call it economics technology because uh, our uh, we all three of us, I mean, the, the, the three founders, we all belong to IT industry. We were uh, working into communication uh, network backbone for uh, Bharat, for the entire country. And uh, this is a complete sea change uh, uh, difference into our careers. I mean, we spent over two decades into IT industry. And then shifting from there to environment ecology, it was all because uh, one of the post lunch discussions, we were just standing outside our office in Kunar Place, New Delhi. And we saw one of the cows eating the garbage. And that was the start point of our journey. I mean, it was like a Newton moment of our life. Uh, for him, it was the apple falling down from the tree. And for us, we saw the cow eating the garbage. And that's how uh, we called the technology as cownomics. Uh, cow is because of the dedicating it to the start point. And till the time you don't have economics attached to it, nobody is interested in listening to what you have to say. Right. So we called it cownomics. And uh, another uh, important perspective was when you uh, have to invent a technology, you also have to give it a name. Right. Because everybody is now going to log on to Google and find out what is this. Right. So if you don't have a unique name, people will not latch on to you because you don't have a presence on the net. And when like if you go and search Madhukar Swambhu on the Internet, You'll always land up on my page only because I have a unique name. That's because my parents gave me this kind of a name, right? So, economics technology is essentially uh, for resurrection of native ecology into soil, water, and air. And we do it through the conjunction point, which is the surface water bodies and the wetlands, where bottom you have soil, then you have water, and then you have air. Now, why this is a unique combination? I mean, we, we look at water bodies as, okay, I know it like back of my hand. But what we don't realize is it is the conjunction point of soil, water, and air. And the exchange between these layers actually give birth to the ecosystem services to the entire vicinity. Like I explained, water body is a heat sink and a carbon sink, right? Uh, similarly, water bodies are natural apparatus for groundwater recharge and groundwater correction as well. I mean, there are plenty of places wherein you find that uh, the aquifer is saline. But if the water bodies are in healthy condition, that salinity is gone and water turns sweet. The groundwater turns sweet, right? We have worked on various projects where in the industrial contamination was adding uh, heavy metals like uh, chromium and arsenic and uh, your uh, uh, various other heavy metals uh, to the water body. But once you start treating the water body back into good health, I'm not talking about cleaning of the water body or beautification of the water body. I'm talking about restoring the health of the water body. All these heavy metals get consumed in the ecology. And whatever contamination is coming in, all that contamination comes with, scientifically speaking, it is called nutrient overload. So why is it called nutrient? Because it has got a lot of nutrition for production of planktons, which are the feed for the fishes. Right. So the moment you increase the population of plankton, the fish population will go up. The moment you have fish population going up, you find flocks of birds around the water body. Birds droppings will create green on the land surface. That will bring back all the bees and the butterflies. So entire life will exuberate around the water body. That's how the ecology responds. Right. So restoring the health of the water bodies is very, very important. And the, the, the way you can make it happen is 
when you are resurrecting the native ecology, when I say water body, the conjunction point of soil, water and air, what it essentially means is you get the biggest pool of the native microbiota of soil, of water and of air, right? The moment you restore their health, they'll start performing the metabolic activities and whatever contamination is coming in, that will get consumed in the ecology itself. See, nature doesn't have any concept of waste or wealth. Both of them are man-made uh, terminologies, right? We attach a value which is hypothetical, which is there in our brain. We attach a value to something, we call it wealth. We detach that value, we call it waste, right? Like if I give you iPhone 2 today, it is of no use to you because the networks have upgraded. So you call it waste. But it was the same phone for which we had a two kilometer long line when it was launched, right? So where is the value? It is the same hardware. It is the same software. Value was there in our brain, right? So nature doesn't have any such kind of a concept. As long as everything is cyclic, the waste for one organism is wealth for another. As long as the cycle is on, it's all sustainable across the globe. We humans create waste. We humans create wealth, right? So nature is all about the cyclic process. And that is what we restore. That is what we thrive to restore in our projects. Thank you. Uh, that was interesting. And if I uh, if I'm not wrong, this is this technology is registered also. Yeah, we filed for a patent. It is a registered trademark for our organization, Vedic Region LLP. Uh, we filed for a patent. The patent is published. Uh, we're just waiting for the grant to happen. So my next question is uh, for Nick. What is your message to those people who believe that ocean literacy is only for those who live near shores? And how can this mindset be changed? Thank you so much. Uh, of course, uh, it is clear that people who live at the uh, at the ocean shores, uh, fishermen, has, seem to have a much higher uh, understanding and awareness of the ocean. Um, I always say the others are just going to the Palenque, which is the local market, and see if there is fish there and everything is fine. So there is no real reaction to it. Um, uh, I think that ocean literacy really has to be at, um, started in the education. This was why it was so infuriating that in the U.S. national standard. Uh, ocean had such a small um, space for over 40 years so it's really a basic educational fact which has to start in the schools at very very early age uh, later in life, it is much harder to get the appreciation and understanding because people are so distracted. Our teenagers have TikTok videos and they are exercising how to dance a certain dance. This is much more important to them in their daily life than uh, thinking about something so far away. So I think early, early in, uh, childhood uh, education has to start. Uh, that's uh, the one way how we can achieve it. Quickly, I'll try to squeeze in um, a question from uh, from our audience. Um, so we'll try and have your thoughts. Uh, so the question is, countries have implemented recycling initiatives to prevent plastic from ending up in our oceans. Uh, despite many initiatives, some of the governments continue to export waste to developing countries where it often isn't properly processed and may end up polluting the environment. Um, the example quoted by one of our audience is that France shipped waste to Indonesia. I'll just add on a quick question to uh, this existing question. Uh, what steps can individual or communities can take to ensure proper recycling and disposal if government practices fail to support these efforts? Thank you. I can start with that. Uh, actually, the whole idea of waste colonialism is on my um, on my list of uh, stories I had been working on. Uh, of course, there was a story which was uh, um, back then even bringing uh, an NGO to apologize politically loud to the Philippines and saying, oh, yeah, it's our waste colonialism. Um, I did two things. Number one, for 10 years, I'm out every day and I'm looking for trash. And I do it in all kinds of areas, from uh, the mountains uh, down to the rivers, from cities uh, uh, down 
to the villages, I'm everywhere, right? And in all these 10 years, I have never found any trash coming from another country. But you should not believe me. What you should do is you should go to um, a website, which is our United Nations Global Partnership on Plastic Pollution and Marine Litter. And there you should look up the data again, literacy. So I looked up how much waste was really imported to the Philippines before, you know, I have been comparing America and the Philippines and pollution to each other with the Coca-Cola consumption. So here I did a comparison between uh, the Philippines waste import and it's uh, six, I'm sorry, 1000 metric tons, six 1000 metric tons in 2022. And uh, the data for um, the United States of America is 372,000 metric tons. They imported much more trash, much, much more trash than the Philippines did ever import. So on a pure scienti scientific uh, uh, basic, based on numbers, uh, you can already see that uh, there's still no correlation between uh, the pollution and, uh, and, and so-called uh, waste colonialism. I also visited a lot of uh, landfields and some of that trash is really you have to understand it's of course bought by companies it's not like uh, somebody is just throwing it over to the philippines there is a business going on there there are companies they are buying the trash they're making money with that uh, some of you will know what the real situation in 2017 was with when china stopped their plastic uh, 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 recycling uh, and and so this trash is not ending up in the rivers and in the pollution of the ocean all the pollution of the ocean i have been with hundreds Hundreds of photos uh, uh, documenting over the last uh, seven to ten years is trash which is being created by the people here every day. So waste colonialism is just another one of those wrong narratives, in my opinion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Madhukar? See, that's not my subject, although, but uh, yes, uh, when it comes to the water bodies, there is a lot of plastic waste uh, which is put into the water bodies and uh, they should be removed and there are a lot of ways and means to actually process it and uh, without creating any kind of contamination to the environment they can actually be utilized in the right fashion uh, so as far as the waste uh, colonization is concerned or export or import of waste is concerned uh, i have had absolute zero knowledge about all this uh, but yes, into the routine life, whatever plastic waste is getting generated, they are uh, in, in, in a small way because there is a lot of startup ecosystem which has come up in Bharat. And there are companies which are dedicated towards solving the plastic uh, pollution problem, uh, reutilizing them into the uh, packaging. And uh, uh, there are some people who are also using it mm -hmm. for fuel production. So there are various ways and means uh, like uh, there was one of the ventures from Tata's uh, which converted it uh, to uh, actually laminate the roads instead of using a tar hole. Uh, so there are various ways and means to actually utilize it meaningfully. And uh, I would, uh, I mean, my knowledge is limited to that as well. Thank you. Uh, Felix, your thoughts? I think that's um, a matter of uh, having networks and, and among the organizations that are carrying out uh, related initiatives on, on advocating against plastic pollution. So I'll consider that as a, as a weakness on the side. So um, because in a country like Kenya, policies are there. Um, the law is very clear. But then when it comes to um, um, Enforcing that, that's where the weakness is. I think our institutions are weak in a way. So the stakeholders, the, the public, the people should consider them as the stakeholders in this conversation and not leave the responsibility fully. Once you all come together, then you're able to have your voice heard. Governments will be active where they see. People are also serious of what they are doing. I feel like uh, it's time for people to come together and have their issues advocated in a stronger way. Thank you for your thought. Well, we are running short of time, and uh, this restricts me to ask any further questions. But I would request our speakers to answer the remaining questions offline. And for our viewers, do sign up our letters and get access to the Q&As and the latest updates. Uh, thank you. Thank you.